Well, good morning and welcome to Saluda Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Jeff. Can y'all say, look at the choir. I know, I know. I, I kept, he just said I kept talking. I guess I wasn't ready for that. Let's try it again. Good morning. Good morning. Wow, y'all were fired up. I guess everybody got plenty of sleep last night. No issues. And the rain, that didn't make you want to sleep in this morning. Y'all are fired up. That's, that's awesome. Pastor Brandon, you have some announcements for the youth. I do. So uh, the first thing, I just want to uh, remind all of our um, youth, uh, we are still doing sign-ups for our youth camp to look up Lodge in July and our mission trip with Mission Serve, which is in June. And uh, sign-ups for that ends on April 2nd. So uh, just be aware of that. The dates and costs and everything um, is available in the bulletin and the sign-up, you can do that in the foyer. Um, I want to remind everyone again about our uh, Club SPC Easter celebration, which is Wednesday, April 5th. That starts at 545. And we're collecting candy. There's a box out in front of my off office for uh, Spring Fest and for our Club SPC Easter celebration. So if you'd like to donate some candy for that, um, you can just place it in that box there. And then the last thing I have is we are in need for some volunteers to help with Spring Fest. So Spring Fest is our community's um, Easter event they do every year and Saluda Baptist we um, kind of man the inflatables and do the egg hunt and do all that stuff for them um, it's a great opportunity just to love on people um, in the community so if you would like to participate and help with that there's a sign up sheet in the foyer thank you wonderful wonderful well I've got a couple of announcements as well these are both in the bulletin but I wanted to bring your attention to those first is the senior adult fish fry we have a sign up uh, sheet out in the foyer uh, just put your name on that. We'd love to have you come. I, I will tell you, it's going to get real crowded if, if I don't watch out with that fish fry. Uh, I know of a certain 27-year-old young man that, that asked me, what does it take to qualify to be a senior adult? <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you who he is, but he might play the bass up here in front. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not naming names, though. Uh, that's two that you've got to get me with now, uh, Britton. Uh, notice in your bulletin, we've, we started publishing our uh, schedule of, of events for Easter uh, Day, Easter Sunday. Uh, we're going to have our sunrise service at 7.30. That'll be down in the lower parking lot, weather permitting. And then we're going to have a breakfast at 8.15. We'll have uh, Sunday school at 9 and then our worship service at 10 o'clock that morning. So we'd love if you'd come and join us. We're going to start publishing that on our Facebook site and on our website and then we're going to put a banner out front, and we're going to have some cards that you can hand out to invite friends and family to come to that. We'd love to have a lot of folks come for Easter morning. Uh, I would like to remind you in the bulletin there's a tear-out section. If this is your first time visiting with us, we'd love to have a record of your attendance. Also, there's a place on there that you could uh, put down your prayer request uh, as well. Now, you know this is one of my favorite times of the service when we greet, but I have to tell you one thing before we greet one another this morning. You see, uh, I, I'm a little uh, on edge this morning because I have to behave. You see, the boss's boss is here this morning. Kelly's mother, wave to everybody, Miss Nancy, is here visiting with us, so I'm going to have to behave. But y'all come by and greet her in a minute. And also her baby brother, who's not so much baby anymore. He's got gray in his beard. I just want to point that out. Y'all, please stand and greet one another. The choir will call you back.
Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning wanting to worship and praise you, dear Lord. We just thank you for the privilege to be here in your house this morning, coming to praise, coming to lift you up, Father, to seek you in your word. And I just pray that you would have your way this morning, have your way in our service. Father, I pray that you would bind all evil in, in any part of evil outside of this building. Keep it at bay. Don't allow it to come into this building. Just allow us to focus upon you and seek you in all that we do. Father, we love you so much, and we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
is what lifted us. Nothing we can do, nothing we can say will lift us up like Jesus did when he poured out his blood for us. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Scripture reading is Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've given us. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, be with each and one that made it here, although it's a dreary day. We're glad to see a good crowd to come to honor and glorify your name. Be with us as we take up these offer offerings and bless them to the furtherment of your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Now we want to invite any children that would like to come forward for our children's corner and then come back to uh, children's church with us. We'll be leaving right after our children's corner to go to children's church. We got everybody now. So, how are y'all this morning? Are y'all good? Yeah? So, I have a problem, and I need someone to help me with my problem. Let's see. Who, which one of y'all thinks you can just, if someone gives you a problem, you can fix it? You can solve it? Anybody good at, like, doing things if someone tells you to do something? Ford, I think you can help me. Okay. Ford, you're going to help me with my problem. Here's my problem. You can stay right there. Have you looked outside? It's horrible. That rain is awful. I want you to stop it raining. You can do that, right? Why not? Forward. Okay. okay. Bane, you can stop it raining, right? No? Why can, can you stop it raining? Can you, can you stop the rain? No? When it's raining, it's a good day because... Well, it, you're, you're right. It is a good day, but you know, Pastor Brandon, Pastor Brandon doesn't like the rain. I, I hate the rain. I, want it, I, I, I do not like the rain, and I wish someone could stop it, but none of y'all can. K- Kempson, can you? I think God. Only Jesus and God can Only Jesus and God? So did you know that the Bible actually, actually talks about Jesus stopping a storm? Isn't that amazing? And you know why Jesus could do that? It's because he's all-powerful. He can do anything. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, for men this is impossible, but for God, all things are impossible. There's nothing that God can't do, and he just wants us to have faith in him that he can do all those amazing things. And we're going to talk more about that in children's church, okay? So first, we're going to bow our heads and close our eyes and pray, and then we'll head out for children's church. God, we just thank you so much for this day, and we thank you that you can do the impossible, that you are all-powerful. There is nothing that you can't do, and and God, we just pray that you would help us to have the faith in you that you can do anything. And we love you, and it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. I don't know about y'all, but... uh... I was kind of hanging on the edge of my seat to see what he was going to say and how he was going to explain uh, how he was going to stop the rain. That was pretty good. I enjoyed that. Good to see so many children down the front row. We always uh, enjoy them being here. Would you join me as we pray? Father God, I just thank you for this incredible opportunity to be able to share your word this morning. And, And Father, I pray that you would be with each and every heart that's here and be with those that are with us online. Father, allow us to just... Uh, Keep all distractions uh, at bay this morning. Allow us, Father, just the the, the ability to be in your presence and to hear from you this morning. Father, to experience you truly in an intimate way. And Father, I pray that we would bless you with our attentiveness, dear Lord, and that we would bless you with our ability to hear your words, and we would bless you with uh, being actionable after hearing your words and applying these to our lives. Father, just allow us to be uh, your, your students this morning, allow us to hear from you and allow us, dear Lord, to just bless you through our words and our thoughts and our actions. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's interesting, you know, I, I wish I could say I planned this out appropriately, but I certainly didn't. Uh, you know, looking outside, it's raining, and it's supposed to be raining, I guess, quite a bit. I didn't see what the ultimate forecast was as far as the amount of rain we are going to get. But this morning, we're going to be preaching about the waters. Uh, In fact, my first thing that I want to do is is to invite you uh, to the shores with me. I want to go to the banks of some waters, and not the waters falling from the sky, but the waters of different bodies of water, if you will. You know, I I think about times in in my life in particular, uh, and, and hopefully and prayerfully in yours, that in different times in our lives, you know, if we want to relax a little bit, just get away a little bit, we may go down to the river and hang out at the river. Or if we tru- truly want to relax, we may go down 
uh, to the lake and hang out at the lake. Some folks are blessed to have places right there on the lake, and I think they just probably live relaxed times all the days of their lives. I'm not sure. I'm looking at some of the folks that live on the lake, and I'm not getting that assurance from them just yet. Uh, another opportunity could be to go to the ocean. You know, a lot of folks, when, when uh, they want to get away and go on vacation, they, they go to the ocean. Uh, I don't know what it is, but anytime you're close to the water, it seems like you can just get mesmerized by the waves that are rippling through. Uh, when we were over in Israel, uh, one of the places that we went to was the uh, uh, Gideon Spring, uh, which is where uh, a natural spring occurred, and there's a great biblical story that goes along with this spring. But uh, I kind of stepped away from everyone, and, and I ran the video on my, my phone and just listened to the trickling of the water. It's just very peaceful. And if you're in the ocean or by the lake, you can hear the, the waters just kind of splashing against the shores, perhaps, or against the boat. Uh, it allows you just to kind of get mesmerized by that thought. And then if, if uh, prayerfully, if you're blessed even further, uh, perhaps the sun may be shining on you, and all of a sudden you're wrapped up in this blanket of warmth, and, and you can just get tucked in, and every, every care, every worry in your life can just go away while you're standing there experiencing this time on, on the water. Now, I remember a time many years ago that uh, I was on the water, and, and I had an interesting outcome. Uh, you see, this is many, I want to say many, many, maybe many years ago when Kelly and I were just dating, right? I'm not going to tell you how many years ago, but that was a few years back. We were dating, and a good buddy of mine and I, uh, we took our girlfriends out to the lake, and he happened to have access to his future father-in-law's boat. Now, I'm not talking about anything fancy. I'm talking about a John boat with a little something back here. I don't even know what it was. But it was enough to get us around, uh, the, especially kind of in the cove or whatever. And you would have thought that we were the two kings along with our two queens, and we were going to show them all the banks and just experience all that is and be these menly men in front of them. He was the captain, and I was the first mate. And all of a sudden, nothing in this world mattered. And we're cruising around the lake, and you can just, just close your eyes and visualize it and, and hear it. You can hear the motor just humming. You know, it's just going in the background. Everything is perfect. And all of a sudden, I heard a pump, pump, pump. Boom. And then I heard this sound of something sinking. And I turned around just in time to see the motor falling into the lake, sinking into the water. And I thought, oh my goodness, what is Terry going to do with his father-in-law? It's not my issue anymore, right? How is he going to handle this? Um, and I'm not going to finish the rest of that story, but, but uh, long story short, that's a glimpse. That's a glimpse of our life. We can cruise along, just everything's fine, and then the motor falls off, and we're in the midst of a storm that we never anticipated in our lives. Today we're going to be in the Bible, in, the, in, in Matthew uh, chapter 14. If you want to go ahead and turn there, we're going to hang out and we're going to take a look at a storm that occurred in the lives of the disciples and the, uh, when, when Jesus was with them. It was a storm that they faced. And now I want to give you a little uh, uh, advantage here, uh, the direction I'm going with this. Most people would look at this text and say it's, it's uh, the text about Jesus walking on the water. But I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of times that we can get too lost in the text, and we may miss the lesson that's intended with the text. We can get lost in the theology and miss the lesson. We can get lost in the words and miss the lesson. And so we're going to look at this perhaps a little deeper not just at Jesus walking on the water, but the entire environment of everything that occurred in this moment. You see, Jesus walked on the water, and Peter walked on the water, and there was a storm, and there was an outcome. But can you talk about the outcome that occurred in that moment? Well, that's what we're going to look at this morning. So I'm going to read uh, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33 for us, uh, if you want to join along in your Bibles. It says, Immediately... And I'm going to reference that term in a minute. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. While he sent the multitudes away. 
And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. It's a wonderful story that we read in the Bible, but there is a lot going on, and there's certain words in, the, in this uh, text that we have to understand to really get to some of the depth that we can find in this passage. And so there's a couple things I want to point out to you in advance of really studying God's Word. Two things that happened prior to this moment in this text. The first thing I would tell you, if you go back to the first part of chapter 14, you would see that uh, what occurred was uh, John, John the Baptist, had just been beheaded. He had been beheaded and Jesus was notably upset. You see, John was more than just a character in the Bible. John was extremely important to Jesus. John was somebody special in Jesus' life. You see, if you look at John the Baptist, you would see that he, in fact, was Jesus' cousin. He was born shortly before Jesus, uh, and, and he had a miracle birth in itself. In addition to that, he preached the gospel, and he did good works along the way, and he was killed for his goodness. And so you can look at John the Baptist and say he mirrored a lot of what Jesus did. In fact, his life probably prepared many for Jesus in the way he lived and in the way he died. Truly, John was the messenger of Jesus. And so as you read the Bible, you would go on to about uh, verse 13, and you would see that Jesus found out about this event and he was troubled. And so he left and went to go find solitude. He went to go be in prayer with his heavenly father. And so he left and departed and went to a different place. And when he got there, apparently others had followed him. They knew where he had gone, and so they followed him. So the great multitude, a great multitude, that's referenced in today's text, shows up to be with them. And Jesus has compassion, the Bible tells us, on them, and he healed them, and he taught them. And in the, in the midst of this, it becomes evening time, and the disciples, being the disciples, say to Jesus, we should send them away so they could get something to eat. And he says, no, we don't need them to, to, to go away. We can feed them right here. And they said, well, wait a second. We don't have enough. We only have five loaves and two fish. How are we going to feed this multitude of people? And Jesus says, bring it to me. Has the people sit down. He blesses the food that they have, and they feed the 5,000. Now, note, and we've talked about this before, the 5,000 is counting only the men, not the women and the children. So there's probably some 7,500, maybe 10,000 people. We don't exactly know how many were there, but there was a great multitude is what it tells us, 5,000 men and women and children. And afterwards, they collected the remnants of the food that was left over, and there was 12 baskets of food that were left over from these five loaves and two fish. And so you have this miracle that's just occurred. You have John the Baptist being beheaded, Jesus being uh, really emotional about that, wanting to have solitude. Then you have the people following him, and he feeds 5,000, and that is where we're at when we start today's text. You have to understand that because there are certain words in here that 
that reference looking back, there's immediately after and the multitudes. There's two words that we have to understand. And so let's find our way through the text today and see what we can learn from the verses in today's text. And so the first thing I would tell you in verses 22 through 24, we see immediately Jesus made, circle that if you write in your Bibles, made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. He made them to get into the boat and go to the other side. And at that point, if you read on, he sent the multitudes away, very next line, and then when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Remember the the incident with John the Baptist. Jesus is still trying to find his time to be with the Heavenly Father to pray and to find solitude in him. And so it tells us they went up onto the mountain up high. Now, the, the, as you read through the Bible and understand this, and if you look at the land, you would understand he went high on the mountain for a couple reasons. One is higher up on the mountain, very little vegetation grew up there, so people wouldn't go up to the top. Plus, down below is where the roads and the byways were, so people would tend to be down lower. So he sought mo- uh, uh, solitude by himself at the top. But now we go back. We need to think about the the disciples. Remember, they'd gone out into the boat. And as we read on, we understand that the disciples are being tossed around in the boat. A storm has come. The boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Don't you find that an interesting phrase? The winds were, or the wind was contrary. They had found themselves in the midst of a storm on the Sea of Galilee, is what we know. The storm, the winds were contrary. So three things we can pick up, or a couple things we can pick up. One, Jesus sent them. Make note of that. Jesus sent them out into the boat, and when they left, everything was fine. They were going to the other side. We don't know exactly at this point where the other side was, but they're going, and now they've run into these contrary winds. Now, pause for just a second, and let's think about our own lives. You see, contrary winds can happen to us at a moment's notice. I talked about us losing a uh, a motor in the lake. That wasn't a contrary wind. That was just a bad bolt that was on the, the motor, but it was lost forever and ever. But think about your life. You can be going right along with your life, and things start to happen in your life. Children don't turn out right. There's illnesses in your family. Parents don't parent correctly. Things happen in this life that are contrary, not what we expected. So the wind is blowing towards us, pushing us away from the journey that we want to follow in our lives and what we think that the Lord wants us to follow in our lives. We have to understand that even though we're in the Lord's will, the Lord may allow winds to blow contrary in our lives for certain reasons. You see, there was a reason that Jesus put them in the boat. Jesus had a plan. Jesus had a lesson for them. As we move on and look at verses 25 through 27, we get to see how the disciples react. That's really the getting to the point of this story. How will the disciples act in this moment when they are stressed, when they are test, tested, when they have something unusual happening to them. And so the gospel writers all do something very much in common here. They use the Roman custom of counting the hours. It tells us in the fourth watch. Well, if you understand the way they would keep up with time, there was four watches from six to nine, nine to midnight, midnight to three, and three to six. And so this was the fourth watch from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. It was in the fourth watch, and what do you know about that time of day or night? That is the darkest that it will be. That is the darkest moment that you'll be in in your life. If you've ever gone out in the middle of the night hunting, fishing, whatever it may be, it is darkest and coldest right before the dawn. That is when uh, the darkness can just uh, completely take you in. And if we think further about what the disciples had been going through, they had been battling winds all night. Remember, they had dinner on the banks, and then Jesus sent them. They were out paddling the boat, 
and the storm came up and blew contrary upon them, and they were struggling all throughout the night. And now it's between 3 and 6 a.m., and they're in a panic. They don't know what's about to happen. They believe that they're about to die on the waters. They've allowed doubt and fear to come upon them. But I, I find it fascinating when I, when I study God's Word and look at uh, the different times when, when the Lord has jumped in. It's always in that darkest hour. And even in our lives, it's always in that darkest hour when we believe that there's no help possible that the Lord will give us help. And I believe there's a reason for that. And we'll talk about that in a few moments. But we see that Jesus comes and he does something fascinating here. I mean, I want you to think about this for a moment with me. Jesus chooses to walk on the water. Of all the different ways that our Lord and Savior could have gotten to the boat, he chose to walk on the water. I mean, think about it. He could have just appeared in the boat. He could have walked to the other side if he wanted to meet him because with all these contrary winds, more than likely he could have beat them there. But he decides to walk on the water. He decides to walk on the water. And the disciples react almost in an expectant way, if you will. They look up, they see a man walking on the water, and they believe it's a ghost. And they say, oh my gosh, it's a ghost. Of course, I'm paraphrasing when I say that. And Jesus says, uh, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. He's basically saying, calm down, calm down. It's me, it's Jesus, you don't need to be afraid. And I know I'm kind of going through this story kind of quickly, but I want to get to some teachable moments that we need to understand. Now, what we see at this moment is quite fascinating. Because Jesus has been walking on the water, getting to them. The disciples see him coming and go, oh no, it's a ghost. Jesus says, don't worry, it's me. Uh, don't be afraid. And Peter says something quite fascinating. Lord, if it is you, command me to come. If it is you, command me to come on the water. And so we hear doubt right off the bat from Peter. If it is you, this is probably the disciple, one of the disciples who is closest to Jesus. Certainly he's one of the 12 who has been closest to Jesus. They've spent a lot of time with Jesus and then he says, if it is you, command me to go. And Jesus tells him, well, come, come on, come on out of the water with me. And so as we look on to the next, he says, come. And when Peter had come out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But as you look at the next verse, you see something. And this is where a lot of people end up teaching and preaching on this passage, is that when he saw that the wind was boisterous, what did he do? He took his eyes off of Jesus, and he looked at the situation that he was in, the storm that he was in, and he began to sink. And he said, Lord, save me. He cried out, Lord, save me. You know, I, I believe that this mirrors a lot of us in our lives when we think about the situations that we're in. We, we get into a storm in life, and we kind of get into a panic. And certainly if you're a man or if you're a guy, more than likely you've tried to fix it. Pastor Brandon already talked about that. We try to fix things. And when we figure out we can't fix things, we cry out, Lord, help us. First we say, Lord, if it's you, right? Think about this for a second. How many times have you been in the middle of a storm and you say, Lord, if you could just show me how I'm going to get out of this. Lord, if you could show me a sign. Lord, if you can give me just a little window of opportunity that I know you're there. Show it to me so I can further believe. There's so many things that we can see in this passage that mirrors our own lives when we get into the storms of life. We want answers and we want solutions on our terms. Not on Jesus' terms, but on our terms. We want to see things immediately, and we want to see that sign that he's going to be there with us, even though we will say Sunday morning in church that we know God is with us at all times. right? But in that doubtful moment, we're not really sure. In that doubtful moment, we'll say, Lord, if it's you, tell me I can walk on the water. 
And that's exactly what we see. And of course, Jesus, or Peter takes his eyes off the Lord. He starts to sink and he said, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. As we look at this, we would understand that, that Peter has had his doubt. And now, not only has he said it by saying, if it's you, he's now shown it because he took his eyes off of Jesus. But now we see Jesus in action. We see Jesus rescue Peter. He holds out his hand, and as Peter is falling, he grabs him by the hand and rescues him. You know, I believe the Lord loves it when we cry out to him, save, save us, save me, save me. Because it's at that moment in our lives that we truly have let go, that we truly have surrendered anything that we are to allow him to save us. He extends his hand out to us to rescue us from our situation that we're in. And as we look at this, he quickly picks them up and notice that they go back to the boat, by the way. There's a, a little thing that's not said that should be read in this text. When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. How did they get into the boat? I believe in all my heart that Jesus grabbed them by the hand and they both walked hand in hand back to the boat, right? It never says that Jesus had to swim with them to get to the boat. He walked with them back to the water. They got in the boat and the wind ceased. And now, as you look at this, something really incredible happens as well. So the winds cease, which tells us, by the way, the lesson that Jesus intended is coming to an end. They get in the boat, and what happens? The disciples say, you truly are the Son of God, and they worship him. They worship him. So it's a great story that we read. It's a great story that we understand, but how, how can we apply this? Why, this story happened some 2,000 years ago. How could it possibly apply to me as I sit here in 2023? And so that's what I want to talk about. I want to share five quick truths with you this morning, and we're going to parallel these in the verse, and we're going to apply it to our lives as well. Five truths. The first one is that uh, he brought me into the storm. He sent them into the storm. He has sent me into storms. Don't ever think that as a Christian, your life is going to be just rosy in all things. That you're not going to have any problems whatsoever. You're going to walk the walk and all the problems are out there, but you get to stay up here. Jesus allows storms in our lives for different reasons. And I will tell you right now, I believe in my heart that really there's two types of storms that Christians will face. Storms of correction and storms of perfection. Storms of correction and storms of perfection. I want to give you an example so you understand this. I want to go back to Jonah for a second. Most everybody knows the story of Jonah and the well or Jonah and the big fish. Jonah had made a, he'd been told by God, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to minister to the people. I want you to preach to the people. They need to repent of their sinful ways. And what did Jonah do? He ran from God. He ran from God, and went and got in the boat, and a storm came on the water, and what happened? He ended up in the belly of the big fish, and then he got out of the belly of the big fish, which that just, talk about a nightmare. I can't even imagine being in the belly of a big fish, but that's a whole different story for another day. But he gets out, and he goes and preaches to Nineveh, and 135,000 people repented. That is a story or a storm of correction. He was going down his own path, but the Lord placed a storm in his life and redirected him to go and do what he intended to do, what the Lord intended for him to do. But now the, the storm of perfection, note this, that the disciples were absolutely in the will of God when they got into the boat. Think about that. He told them to get in the boat. He didn't tell them to get in the boat to harm them. He told them to get in the boat because he had something in store for them that they needed to learn. They had a lesson. He had a lesson for them to learn, a lesson of perfection that they could further and grow their faith in their life. So he made them to get in the boat. They got in the boat. The storm occurred, and he was trying to grow their faith. And so you have storms of correction and storms of perfection, but God certainly places a believer in a storm from time to time. And please understand this, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you will always 
be living in a life where you are sent somewhere. You may be sent to lead your family. You may be sent to live just in this wretched world to try to lead others to Christ. You may be sent to a foreign country to, uh, to, to be a missionary, but you are always sent by the Lord. And in this case, they were sent on the boat with the task. They didn't fully understand it, but God had a storm in, in mind for them so that they could grow. And so he placed them there. We need to understand that. He brought them there. He brings us into the different storms that we may face in life. But if he places you in a storm, rest assured that he will come. And we see this clearly. That's the second truth. He will come to me. The Bible tells us when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Jesus waited until the storm was at its peak with the disciples. It was the darkest hour of the night. The disciples were completely stressed and tired. There was no hope. Yet that's when Jesus showed up. Why did Jesus walk on the water? My humble opinion, he wanted to show the disciples that the water, which they greatly feared, was just a stair step for him to walk on. He used their fear to walk to them and greet them and help them in their time of fear. Jesus used their fear and showed them that he could overcome the water. But why, think about this, why and this, if you don't hear anything today other than this next point, hear this. Why didn't they recognize Jesus? Because they weren't looking for him. They were looking at the storm. They were looking at their fears. They were letting that overcome them. They were looking at the storm. They didn't look for Jesus. They didn't hear Jesus. They didn't even recognize Jesus. You want to know why you need to be in your Bible every day? You, need, you want to know why you need to be in Sunday school? You, need to know, you want to know why you need to be in church? You want to know why you need to be in a Bible study at different times at night? So you can recognize the voice of the Savior. So you can recognize his words when he's calling you, when he's coming to you. They didn't even recognize the Savior on the water. I've talked about this before. Faith and fear cannot coexist in your heart and in your mind. They had allowed fear to overcome them to the point that they could not hear the Savior at all when he was coming. They couldn't recognize him when he was coming. They allowed fear to overcome their lives. So we have that he placed them there. We have that he will come to you. Thirdly, he will help me grow in the situation. You see, a storm of perfection allows me to grow in my faith and grow in my walk with the Lord. This particular lesson was about their faith. It wasn't about Jesus walking on the water. And that's what we all remember, is Jesus walking on the water. And we remember Peter trying to walk on the water. But we don't talk about faith in story. This story is all about their faith and them growing in their faith. That's the purpose of this storm that occurred in their life. So the third thing is he'll help me grow. The fourth thing is he will see me through the storm. There's a verse, and I want you to write this down, and I want you to memorize this verse, and I want you to hold this verse to the, to the end days of your life. I believe it's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12, or 2. He is the author and perfecter of my life. He is the author and perfecter of your life. He is the author and perfecter, period. And so we can't just read that verse. We need to believe that verse. If he starts something in my life, he is absolutely going to finish whatever his desire is in my life. He sent them into the boat. Certainly he's going to get them to the destination that he intended. Please cling to that verse and know, know that he will always help you grow in the situation. The last, the last uh, truth that you can learn from this and this is a hard one. This is a hard nugget for us to get a hold of because we, we are such a self-centered uh, nation and, and group of people that live in this world. It's all about me. And every side sidetrack for just a second. Y- y'all know we just got back from, from Israel and, and, and we went to the Via Della Rosa and we went to uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is some of the holiest places you could ever imagine. And while we were there, pe- people have asked me, what did you think? Did you enjoy it? Did you? And, and all I could think about the whole time I was there was how people pushed and shoved and cut in line and tried to be hateful to one another. 
Why? It's because it mattered to them to be first. It didn't matter that they were in, in this place that Jesus, uh, with the, the tomb that was empty. They wanted to be hateful. They wanted to be their own prideful self, which is such a reflection of the society that we live in. It's not about you and I at all. It's about Jesus Christ. And we need to always remember that in all that we do. And in this situation, this wasn't about Peter. This was about the other disciples. Think about this for a second. He, Jesus came walking on the water. Peter saw him and said, Lord, if it's you. So we see that he already has some doubt. But, and so he starts to walk. He starts to fall. Jesus picks him up, and he, they go back to the boat, and they get in the boat. What happened at that moment? The disciples said, you truly are the Son of God. And they worshiped him. Do you realize this is the first time in the Bible that the disciples worshiped Jesus? Previously, they saw a storm and they saw him calm the storm. And what they said at that point is, what kind of man is this? Here they say, you truly are the son of God. And they bowed down and worshiped him. They grew in their faith. They grew in their belief of Jesus Christ being the Savior. So anytime God places you in a storm, it's not necessarily about you. All the other disciples were watching what Peter did. They were watching what Jesus did. And they all grew because of it. In our storms that we face in our lives, know this, that people are watching you and how you react. Do you walk in faith in the midst of the storm that you may be facing? Or do you bow down and give in to the fears of the world that you live in? My prayer is that you'll look at this story and see it with a whole different set of eyes than you have be ever have before. I want you to see this story and to read this story and not just read it with your eyes, but to read it and hear it with your heart. That you can truly experience the Lord and know what he intended with this. You see, you can layer this out and say, okay, Lord, you sent them uh, out into the boat. Are you willing for him to send you? Are you willing right now for the Lord to send you into a storm, knowing that it may be a tough time that you're going to go through? And in the midst of that storm, how are you going to react? Are you going to ask why? Most of us say, why me, Lord? Why did you place me in the storm? I think our question ought to be, why not? Why not use me, Lord, however you can? to glorify you. See, that's my purpose in life, and that's your purpose in life too. The Bible is very clear on that. Our purpose in life is to glorify God, nothing else. So will you look at this story? Will you take the story in and allow it to be the, 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 the impetus, if you will, that you need to continually look for ways to grow in your faith? Because remember, when you're in that storm, others are watching you. Others are watching you, and hopefully and prayerfully, they will grow from the way you treat your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The word from God today is to stay strong in your faith, even, even in these deep waters of life. As I come to a close, I would ask you with heads bowed and eyes closed, are you ready to be used by God in any way that he desires? Do you look at your storms and see yourself and wonder why has God put me in this situation? Are you questioning God? Are you doubting God because of some situation that you may be going through? My prayer this morning is that we all would learn from this passage today and not just focus upon walking on the water, but rather the faith and the growth that we see in the disciples as they come to love and truly worship the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's what we're called to do. So, Father, I just pray this morning. Lord, I call out to you and just ask that your mighty hand be upon us as a church body. Father, would you use us in a mighty way? Father, would you convict hearts, dear Lord, hearts that may not know you as their Savior? Father, this morning I pray that you would convict each and every person that uh, has never come to know Jesus. And maybe today might be the day that they would come to know you as their Lord and Savior. Father, I pray over those that may be hurting, that need healing. Father, he healing from a spiritual standpoint, that, they, that they've walked and drifted away into the ways of the world. Father, they need to be pulled back to you. Father, a storm of correction. Father, we pray that you would allow us to, to just be drawn closer to you. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you would heal them spiritually, that they would be drawn towards you, seeking you in all that they do. 
Father, I also pray for physical healing. I know there's many issues that are out here, Father, different issues that we have physically. Father, I pray over those right now. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would provide the healing that's needed on each and every, each and every person that's here. Father, and we commit to you right now. We will glorify you. We will testify of you in your healing powers. And Father, I pray for those that may be looking for a new church home. Father, as my prayer is that they can see we're a Bible-preaching, Bible-teaching church. And Father, if it's your desire that people would worship here and join in fellowship, may your will be done. Father, whatever the need is, I pray over each and every person that's here today and those online that you would touch them in an intimate way, that they would feel and experience you as their Savior. Father, we love you so much, and we just give you all the praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you please stand as we have a song of invitation. If I could ask you all to please have a seat. We're going to have a real quick business meeting, and then I'm going to talk about this precious family that just came forward, and we just had a little family reunion here in front of you all. But uh, 